Believe in yourself, cause it starts with you And then everyone else will believe you too And if it looks like you're the only believer around Just keep on believing, don't put yourself down Just believe Our guest this week grew up in Tallahassee, Florida Earned a BS in business management from Liberty University and a J.D. of Law from Florida State University, and was Miss Virginia in 1990. At 29, she decided to try a career in journalism and broadcasting. And in 2007, she joined Fox News as their chief legal correspondent. And since 2022, she's been the host of Fox News Sunday. The author of three best-selling books, her name, Shannon Breen. And I'm Jack Crisula, and this is Anything is Possible on 760 WJR. I'm Jack Crisula. This is Anything is Possible, and we're talking to the host of Fox News Sunday, Shannon Bream. This is Tall Cotton. Shannon, welcome. Jack, I am so honored to be with you. Can you lead us as we embark on 2024 in an opening prayer this evening? I will, yes. Um, Lord, I thank you for bringing us together for conversation that I pray will be uplifting and encouraging to people. Uh, the holiday is a time of celebration, but for some, it is a difficult time. So, Lord, mm-hmm. I hope that you will help us to process mm-hmm. all that we've been through in another challenging year, but give us hope and encouragement and joy in looking ahead to 2024. Thank you for these conversations that Jack hosts. May it guide us all closer to you and to a better trust in you and a better faith in you and the good things that are to come. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. What if we go back to your childhood and your parents, please? Okay. Go ahead. Well, you know, I grew up, I have no memory of my parents being together. They were married, but they divorced by the time I was a year old. They were both very young, and they would admit very immature and young in their faith, too. My mom was still very much a young Christian at that point, and she and I grew up together in many ways. I think both as almost, you know, a big sister, little sister situation because we were so close in age, but but also in our faith. We both grew a lot together as youngsters, so... You know, living in a divorced home meant that I was going back and forth. Um, It also meant beautiful things in that we lived with my grandparents during my childhood, which is such a fond memory for me. I was so close to them, and that was a beautiful blessing, kind of a silver lining in the rockiness of my parents' um, marriage falling apart. So my mom um, was a young educator and took a job at a Christian school, which also at that time required her to be a part of the church. So that formed community for us, and that meant that when I was in school and when I was at church, I mean, that really was sort of like our family. And I was being taught scripture and being taught all the things my mom thought were so important about humility and servanthood. And all of those things were being poured into me on multiple fronts. And um, so while it wasn't the perfect ideal childhood that you would think of, a Norman Rockwell situation, there was a lot of good there. And I'm so grateful for it. Your life has been anything but normal, Shannon. Okay. (laughs) Of which... You've got two tiaras. You were Miss Virginia in 1990 and Miss Mm -hmm. Florida in 1995. What did those experiences do for you? You know, for me, um, I remember as a kid watching the Miss America pageant on TV with my mom and my grandma, and I would see these women who were glittering and articulate and glamorous, and I thought, wow, that's amazing. I I wonder how you get there. And then once I learned that the Miss America program is all about scholarship money um, and having a platform of service that you do during your year, I thought, wow, that there are so many other benefits to this I didn't understand. And so for me, it was a great experience of um, when I was 19 years old, I was in school in Virginia. I entered a local pageant, did terrible in my first one, forgot my piano piece, ran off the stage in embarrassment, um, cried my eyes out, and decided I would give it another try while I was still afraid but wanted to give this a chance. Competed in that next local pageant, went on to Miss Virginia that summer, had no concept that I would have a chance to win and become Miss Virginia at all. But that was the Lord's plan, and between that and going on to compete in Miss America and being the top 10 there, I got enough scholarship money to pay for my final years of college and graduate debt-free. So a wonderful experience that also required me as a 19-year-old 
you know, to go and do a lot of traveling and public speaking and interacting with adults and um, veterans and, and corporate officers and all kinds of different people I never would have met otherwise. So that was a fantastic experience. I thought I was done, sort of retired from my pageant career. But five years later, when I was in law school back home in Florida at Florida State, I had a chance to enter, which is a different system than Miss USA system. A lot of people don't know there are two different organizations. But again, that helped me to graduate law school debt free and um, showed me the world in different ways that I don't think I would have experienced otherwise. All right. Your stepdad encouraged you to go to law school and become a lawyer, Mm -hmm. which you did from Florida State. Talk about those years of practicing law, please. Jack, they were hard. I'm not going to lie. Even when I was in law school, I thought, ooh, I'm not sure this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I love the idea of the research, of the writing, of the advocating, all of that. But I thought, um, I don't know that this is what I'm created for. This is my passion in life. So I did practice a few years as a young attorney. I had a wonderful firm and good mentors within that firm. But I'm a current events junkie, and I am, I think, at heart a storyteller, and I really wanted to be in the front lines of journalism and communications, and so I had a really strange transition, which we can talk about, but those years as a young attorney, I feel like will always benefit me because it did teach me to research, to write, to question, to probe for answers, to dig for answers in a way that I get to use every day as a journalist in just a fashion that I think I'm much more created to do this. I'm appreciative of those years, but my goodness, I feel so blessed to do what I do now. We're talking to Shannon Bream. She went from being a young attorney. At age 29, she walks into a TV station, Tampa, Florida, and she went from being a young attorney to a grandma intern. And when we come (laughs) back, we're going to ask, we're going to talk to grandma intern, Shannon Bream. And I'm Jack Pasula, and this is Anything is Possible on 760 WJR. Welcome back to Anything is Possible. I'm Jack Crisula. We're with Shannon Breen. All right, Shannon, you're a lawyer in Tampa. You're 29 years old. You decide, I want to get into journalism. And you walk into a TV station in Tampa Mm -hmm. where they name you Grandma Intern. What did you do? What did you do? Oh, my goodness. So I decided I would keep my law firm job during the day, but any time I had a little extra time overnight or weekends, I got an internship at the local ABC station. And I would go there and just do whatever they needed. I would answer phones and make coffee. I would go out on the field with producers or cameramen and women and reporters, anybody who would let me tag along who was kind enough to let me shadow. And I would just take notes and I would try to learn from them. Um, And occasionally I would write up my own stories. I would take take them to my boss or one of the other managers and say, can you give me feedback? I mean, legal writing, my years as an attorney, very different than writing for journalism, for print or for TV. So I just was kind of a sponge. I would go with anybody who would let me tag along and ask for feedback. And it was during that internship that I went to my boss there and said, you know what? I'm going to leave my law firm, and I think that I'm really going to pursue a job in journalism. This was three months or so into this internship that you know followed the co- the college semester schedule, and he said, you know, no one here has offered you a job. And I said, yes, technically, but I'm kind of stepping out in faith. And I went back to my firm and said to them, I'm going to leave. And I had several um, partners there say, what are you doing? You've invested all this time in your legal career and in legal schooling. What are you going to do? Uh, this is madness. But then I had a couple of attorneys there who said, you know what? There was something else I always wanted to do, and I, and I didn't take the chance. I didn't take the leap, so I'm going to be cheering for you in this. Hmm. All right. In the previous segment, you said your first attempt at Miss Virginia didn't go so good, but right. uh, how was your first TV broadcast, and how did that go? You know what? When I, that boss who I said, I I want a job here, he did come to me a few weeks later. He says, we've got this job that's 2 a.m. to 11 a.m. You would come in and do all these same things. You're going to answer the phone and make coffee. Um, You're going to then write scripts for the morning show anchors. I eventually started working the prompter. I mean, I was taking on anything they would let me do. And he came in one day and said, I'm eventually going to let you, if everyone else is tied up and we have breaking news, you may be able to run out and do a story on camera. So I started doing a little bit of that here and there and trying to learn my way through trial and fire. 
And I came in one day, that boss was gone, his boss was gone, there was a complete management change. And everybody said, oh, it's so bad when there's a new manager. And I thought, well, I am not making any money. I love this job. I'm working overnight. I'm happy to do anything. I felt pretty safe. But two weeks into the new guy's tenure, he called me in and said, I've been watching you. I don't know why anybody thought it was a good idea to put you on TV. You're terrible. He said, you are the worst person I've ever seen on TV and you will never make it in this business. I hope you're a better lawyer than a reporter because you need to go back to that. And it was extremely humbling. Um, and it felt almost physically painful. I, I went into one of those soundproof edit bays where they cut the stories together. And I cried for a couple of hours and just called anyone I thought who loved me um, to talk me through this. And I thought, what have I done? I've blown up my legal career. I've gone into TV and I'm being told I'm the worst ever. Have I made a mistake? Shannon, God works in strange ways. Maybe he, he was just prepping you for becoming the Fox News Sunday host with some of these Maybe guests. So. Okay, All right. Um, talk to us. If there's somebody out there tonight that's got a dream mm-hmm. and people are saying nonsense, nonsense, never mm-hmm. happened. F- believing in yourself and following your dream. If you yes. Could, please. Oh, I so want to encourage people because I heard way more no's than I ever heard yes. And that continues now. Like every week, you know, we have to fight for bookings with the White House and senators and political candidates and all kinds of people. And you'll hear no way more than you hear yes. So I think if you can just learn in life, and Jack, I know you've experienced this, that when something fails, that's not the end of the road. There's another person. There's another way forward. So I heard a lot of no's in trying to get started in the business and trying to find that next job after getting fired from that first TV job. Um, but I would say to you, if you've got a passion, if you've got a dream, nurture it. Now, that means a lot of things. Don't give up on it. But it also means, as I had to do, take a look in the mirror. Where can you improve? How can you better your skills? How can you work on things, whether it's networking, making contacts? Don't expect that you're going to wake up and your dream just comes true one day. For a few people out there that are very fortunate, that happens. But for most of us in the world who've had any success, we would say there's a lot of hard work that goes so that when those opportunity comes, you're ready. So I would say, please don't give up on your dream. It's in your heart for a reason. And you may be the one unique person in the world who sees things a certain way or has a better way of doing something or an invention or something you want to do. And so um, nobody can question that that's real and it's viable, but don't expect anything uh, to happen short of you giving everything that you have. And I think when you have a passion and a dream, those hours don't seem so long. The sacrifices don't seem so tough because you're working toward, I think for many of us, what you feel like you were created to do. We're talking to Shannon Bremen from 2000 to 2007. She was at local affiliates in Tampa, Charlotte, Washington, D.C. And then God brought you an angel by the name of Britt Hume <laughs> in 2007. Tell us about, well, Sheldon Bream was another angel for you. Okay. We got to yes. put that in there, Sheldon. But Britt Hume, mm-hmm. an angel. Please. Mm -hmm. Okay, so first of all, Sheldon is my husband, and December 30th is our 28th anniversary. Thank you, Lord. Um, And he has been my greatest champion through the firings and the difficulties and everything else. And it was actually his idea that connected me with Britt Hume, who was at that time heading up our D.C. Bureau for Fox News, was our 6 p.m. main political anchor, and he's a man of faith. And there was a lot I knew about Britt, but a lot I didn't know. But he was giving a speech, my husband books professional speech. Speakers. He was giving a speech, and Sheldon said to me, you got to come with me. We'll be in the green room if, you know, things are running behind. Maybe you can have a chance to talk to him, make your pitch for trying to get your foot in the door at Fox, which I've been trying to do for years. And I did think that sounded, as I always say to people, a little stalkerish, but it also sounded like the best plan I'd had so far to actually see Britt face-to-face. And that's what happened. We went there. The program was running behind. We talked with him in the green room. And at first, he was very polite. Um, my husband said to him, Britt, I don't know if you recognize my wife. She's a local news anchor here in Washington. And Britt said to me, oh, that's very nice. What do you want to do? And I just screwed up all my courage and said, I'd love to come work for you at Fox. And he was very polite, but sort of blew me off saying, oh, yeah, I get that all the time. He said, send me your stuff. I'll take a look at it. And I was a little bit discouraged. I decided to take a walk outside that green room. And while I was gone, he had a conversation with Sheldon and said, you know, does she like politics? What does she like to cover? Does she like legal stuff? And my husband said, oh, yes. When she was in law school at Florida State, she actually worked on a scholarship program in the Florida House of Representatives. I I would split my day between school and the legislature. And Britt said, law school? Did she graduate? My husband said, yes, she graduated with honors. And Britt said, 
do you think she'd want to cover the U.S. Supreme Court for Fox? And Sheldon said, well, I don't want to speak for her, but I do think she'd be very interested in that. So I'd left the room being sort of politely brushed aside. And when I came back in, Britt said, when can you start? And I looked at my husband, what happened in the five or ten minutes I was gone? But it was clear then that a door had opened. Leave it to a guy. That's what we all say. <laughs> okay. Get it done. Fox News started in 1996 by a guy named Rupert Murdoch. Mm-hmm. Have you ever met him? Oh, many times, yes. What's He's he like? He's very much in, involved in, in shepherding us and guiding us forward. Sure. So, all right. We're talking to Shannon Bream. And uh, when we come back, we're going to get the lowdown on Washington, D.C., the swamp. And I'm Jack Krasula, and this is Anything is Possible on 760 WGR. This is Anything is Possible. I'm your host, Jack Krasula, and we're talking to Shannon Bream, the author of three best-selling books, Finding the Bright Side, Women of the Bible Speak, and Mothers and Daughters of the Bible Speak. All right, let's jump to August 11th, 2022. Fox has been around for 26 years, and they've had their Sunday morning show. Only two anchors, Tony, the late, great Tony Snow, mm-hmm. and then... Chris Wallace, bigger than life, Chris Wallace, Mm -hmm. and they announce that they're going to have a lady as the third hostess, Shannon Bream. What was that like, Shannon? I literally could not speak when I got the call about that because I was so dumbfounded. It did not occur to me that I would be the person to have a chance to step into this amazing team, this amazing tradition of Fox News Sunday. So Sheldon and I just sort of looked at each other like, are they serious? We just, it was truly a moment of disbelief. Um, I love covering Washington. It is full of characters and policy and debates. And it's been a joy to be here primarily covering the Supreme Court, but really, you know, being on the campaign trail and covering Capitol Hill and all those things, too. So I was blown away and so excited by the opportunity. And it's not lost on me. I'm still incredibly grateful every Sunday that I step up to do that show and and thank the Lord that he gives me the opportunity to do something like your title says, anything really is possible. How do you prepare for the show every week? I love to research. You're probably like this, too. I want to know everything about somebody that I'm going to have on, from where they are on policy positions to, like, who their favorite band is. I mean, I really try to find out what their hobbies are, what they do. That's not just all the Washington stuff, too. So I love to do a deep dive. I have binders and folders and stacks on everybody who comes on the show. And so it's a lot of research during the week. It's other TV and radio and podcasts and things during the week. And a lot of our energy and effort is spent booking. I reference this, that we really do a lot of negotiating with the White House, um, with candidates, with all kinds of folks to see how our show is going to come together every week. Sometimes we're on the road and we travel. So there's a lot of prep that goes into that. And by Sunday morning, when I walk in the studio, I just sort of have to leave it there saying, all right, I've done everything. I've, I've prayed that God would favor our work and our team. And now let's have these conversations that hopefully get some information for any audience member in America or beyond who's watching. You got this great guest, and he or she won't answer the questions. Mm-hmm. What do you do? What do you do? Yeah, you're so right. Um, there are sometimes people are very locked into their talking points. And I think if you know that's coming, then you've got to have three or four ways to try to skin the cat. Um, I think about Senator Joe Manchin, who's been asked countless times if he's going to run for president. I've asked him countless times. And I think rephrasing the question, would you rule this in? Would you rule that out? Um, I think sometimes you have to do um, ab- abandon your notes. I think that, you know, you do all the prep you can, but then you follow them and and try to find that opening um, that maybe they give you with their answer that you hadn't mapped out, you hadn't anticipated. So just be ready to pivot, do all that research and be ready, but then be ready to just ad lib and follow them in the moment. We're talking to Shannon Bream since 2022. She's been the host of Fox News Sunday. Soon thereafter, you got a text from Mike (laughs) P. Mike Mm -hmm. P. Please. Oh, my goodness. Um, You have heard this story. I did. It was something like, congratulations on your big new contract or new show with Fox. 
And I thought, Mike P., this is so exciting. Could it be former Secretary of State CIA Director Mike Pompeo, who I know and am friendly with? How thoughtful that he would reach out to me. But then I thought, could it be Mike Pence, the former vice president, who I also know and have interviewed many times? And I thought, well, you can't just do a blanket reply, like, thanks so much for your good wishes. I need to figure out who this is. So I thought, I didn't have the number in my phone. I'm going to you know, talk with some friends, figure out whose number this is. And the next day, I was out walking my dog in the neighborhood. And my neighbor looks up and says to me as I'm walking by, oh, you're too big time and fancy now to answer my text. That was my neighbor, Mike Papalardo. That was the Mike P. So sometimes don't get ahead of yourself and, and think you're too big for your britches. Um, although I did good, good wishes from the two other Mike P's. That was not a personal text from either one of them. All right. Some would say this woman's had a perfect life, no setbacks, fairy tale life. Mm-hmm. Everything turns to gold for her. Mm-hmm. You've had challenges with Sheldon mm-hmm. in health. Talk mm-hmm. about Sheldon's challenges with health and then your challenges, please. Yeah, I think this is so good to be transparent because none of us has a life that looks like our Instagram feed. Um, we all get, you know, rough phone calls and fired and bad diagnoses and financial ruin. Like, we all walk through difficulties every single day. And for Sheldon and I, um, early on, we were engaged. We weren't even married yet. And he was having all kinds of unusual health problems. It took several months and could never get a a correct diagnosis, and part of it was losing his hearing. So eventually, um, his ear, nose, and throat doctor said, well, there's one more thing we need to rule out. He goes in for testing, and they give us a call not long after that saying he's got a brain tumor. And when you're 24 and your whole life is ahead of you, that's terrifying any time to get that call. But we were just sort of dumbfounded. We were planning a wedding. Um, I was in law school. You know, we just were on the cusp of all these exciting, wonderful things. And it was a, a a long, painful, you know, really something that shakes you to your core battle. But the beautiful thing we found through that is, first of all, it strengthened our relationship in really dynamic and deep ways. It also reminded us of the body of Christ more broadly. When we would get a note from a church we'd never been to who would say, we heard about your story, we put you on our prayer list— It was a beautiful expression of seeing other people caring for us, whether they knew us or not. And it was a long recovery for Sheldon, and he had some permanent, um, you know, problems from the surgery and things that he went through. But we were so grateful that his life was spared, and he's healthy on this side of that. And we've been able to work through the other things, but it makes me never take him for granted. I'm so grateful for every day I have with him, and that we did get married, and we've had all these decades together. Um, For me, the challenges came much later, around my 40th birthday. I started to have excruciating pain, started with one eye, then it went to the other eye, and it was, you know, only intermittent, and then it became, you know, weekly, then it became daily. And it was so bad. I mean, it really was a 10 on a 10 when they ask you about the pain scale. And I was going from doctor to doctor trying to get some kind of diagnosis. I often operated with, you know, double vision and a migraine that was triggered by this in addition to the eye pain that I was having. And I was really walking through a fog because I couldn't sleep. This would happen in the middle of the night and wake me up. And for anybody who you're struggling with something mentally or physically when you don't sleep, it exacerbates everything and made it just that much more difficult. So finally, almost two years into this, I got to a doctor. I was very despondent. I had really toyed with thoughts of ending my own life. I couldn't see a way forward living in that level of pain every day of my life. It seemed pointless. And Sheldon and I, you know, I leveled with him about how dark things had gotten. And he said, let's look for a new doctor. I had one doctor tell me, you're very emotional. And I went to him with this. And that scared me off from doctors for a long time. But I finally found a new doctor, went to him. He was fantastic. Before he even examined me, he looked at my notes and he said, I think I know what you have. You, I know what you have. Did the exam, he said, yes. And for the first time in almost two years, I had this spring of hope. Went through the appointment, and at the very end, he said to me, but there's something you need to know. There is no cure for this. And that sent me into a new spiral of real struggle and real doubt and struggling, you know, in my conversations with God, how can this be? Why would you allow me to find this doctor and then there'd be no cure for this? But God told me through that, not that he would cure me, but there was a moment as I sat crying in my car alone, um, he said, I'll be with you. I felt that I heard him say that in my spirit. And that's been true through all the therapies, the recovery, the surgery that I've had that's given me almost a normal return to life with my eyes and their function. Um, There is no cure 
but I've gotten as close as I could, and I'm very grateful for that. We're talking to Shannon Breen. Her first book is <clears throat> Finding the Bright Side, The Art of Chasing What Matters. She's as beautiful on the inside as she is on the outside. It's an honor to have Shannon Breen. And I'm Jack Crisula, and this is Anything is Possible on 760 WJR. Jack Krizula, host of WJR's Anything is Possible, the weekly radio visit, brings his 15 years of inspirational storytelling to hardcover. With God, anything is possible. Anything is possible. 15 of Jack's more than 750 tales of defeating odds and achieving the extraordinary. Like Bob Woodruff, whose job covering the war in Iraq nearly cost him his life. And Nick Vujicic, the limbless evangelist who has stunned millions with his message of acceptance and grace. With God, anything is possible. Order now while signed copies are still available at trustinusllc.square.site. That's trustinusllc.square.site. And as Jack says, Make it a great week because with God, anything is possible. Spohol. I'm Jack Rasula. This is Anything is Possible. And we're talking to Shannon Breen. First book, Finding the Bright Side, The Art of Chasing What Matters. Shannon, you're very open about your faith. Mm -hmm. Um, Doesn't that hurt you in your career? You know, I, I do think that there were times when people did not love it. I was told at one point, you know, one of my bosses who's long gone from Fox, um, would say that I was too churchy. That was his word. And that um, I was just a little bit too open with talking about that. But I found over the years, I tried to manage that. You know, how do I follow these directions I'm getting from executives to be more sexy, to be more appealing to the audience, um, to, to walk down that path? And really having almost a crisis at one point thinking like, gosh, this feels like I'm really betraying who I am, a child of the king, And um, a daughter who doesn't need to be chasing after these worldly approval measurements and those kinds of things. And I decided at one point, I'm just going to fully embrace who I am, which is a person of faith. Um, That has to guide all my decisions. I'm not chasing these other things. And um, I just felt very comfortable with that. I thought if that means that I'm never promoted in an earthly fashion or moved to any other dream jobs or anything else, the Lord's going to use my faithfulness wherever I am. And I can just have peace and contentment in walking with Him and whatever assignment He's got me on. And so I found at some point that it became a plus for me, personally and professionally, in that um, there will always be people from the outside who are going to take shots at that and say, it makes you strange that you are radical if you actually believe the Bible or want to follow Christ. Um, but I've had people show up in my office in times of crisis who say, I'm not a religious person. I don't know how this works, but I've got, a, I've got this real problem, and I know you pray. Will you pray for me? Um, you know, to professionally, you know, a few years ago, having Fox come to me to say, we know your faith is a big thing in your life. We're thinking about getting into publishing books. Would you work with us on doing a book about women and faith? And what a huge blessing. I felt like the Lord allowed me just to be his messenger and put that in my lap. And it ended up as a number one New York Times bestselling book, which we, I chuckle about. I don't think the New York Times loved having a Fox book or a book about the Bible in the number one slot. But anything is possible, right, Jack? I mean, yes. that's what the Lord does. So I have always felt... Um, that faithfulness to Christ and His call is something that will never return void. It doesn't guarantee us good things or success in this life. In fact, Christ warns us, you're going to have trouble on this earth, but it's okay because I've overcome all of it. We're going to get to that book in a minute, but one, one more question. On your Twitter account, here's what it says, quote, I am a sinner saved by grace. Shannon, Why? You know, I think it's so important, especially if you're a person of faith, to say, I am not perfect. There's no one in the Bible who was not flawed but Christ himself. Um, I very much ask for forgiveness every day of my life. I need that. Um, I mess up. I have deep regrets in my life. I think if we're all being honest, we do. But the other side of that message is that there's hope for redemption. I believe Jesus when he said, I didn't come to condemn, but to redeem. And so I think it's a good reminder every day of my life or every day that I log on social media, like I really 
am a sinner saved by grace. I'm grateful for second chances, millionth chances um, to get things right and to um, constantly be needing less forgiveness. That's what I pray. Lord, I thank you for forgiveness. Help me to need less of it, but to acknowledge that I do need it. All right. As you mentioned, your second book, Women of the Bible Speak, the mm-hmm. wisdom of 16 women in our lessons for today. If you profiled two of those 16, <laughs> who would they be in, please? You know, I love Deborah from the Old Testament, and I think it's a helpful person to point out because a lot of people who have reservations about religion or they think that the faith is women are sort of second-class citizens in the Bible, that's just not true at all. You can look at Jesus' relationships with women all throughout the New Testament. That's a mythbuster right there. But I love to point to Deborah in the Old Testament as well because she was actually the leader of Israel when we meet her. She was sort of the judge who dis- uh, settled their disputes, but she also was leading the nation and that's not something that happens by accident. And she was a woman. And if you know her story at all, um, God tells her to go into battle against the Canaanites who were desperately oppressing the Israelites. And um, he says, do it. She goes to the head of her army and says to this man, all right, God says that we are going to um, go into battle against the Canaanites, and he doesn't want to do it. He's like, "Ah, not so sure about that. I'll only do it if you go with me. And through that, she then ends up being a military leader, taking her people into battle. All the odds were stacked against them. What a beautiful thing when they have a complete routing of the Canaanites, um, and God is faithful to the Israelites and and to Deborah's willingness to step into a very difficult situation. Um, I love the study uh, the story of Rahab also. I fought to include her in the book. She's somebody that most scholars and most interpretations of the Bible believe that she was a prostitute. But when Israel's spies went in uh, to the land and needed to overcome Jericho, you know, she hit them. She gave them cover. She lied to protect them. And in exchange, they rescued her and her family. She ends up in, you know, being adopted into the Jewish heritage, into that um, lineage there. And I think, you know, there, it just showed me that God can use anyone. It doesn't matter our station in life, what we're doing. We're all flawed. Um, but it's our willingness to step up in moments that we need to show courage, great and small, that he can use us. Speaking of using you, all right, the first time you tried for Miss Virginia, you were awful. Then the mm-hmm. first time you're on TV, the boss tells you, you're the worst <laughs> I've ever seen. All right? yes. Some would say, she's too nice. She's too kind. Mm-hmm. She's got t- too much grace. She'll never <laughs> be successful in the swamp. It's true. How, I mean, how do you do it? You know, I think that everybody has their own style. And for me, um, growing up in the South was very much about... I do think you can get more flies with honey. I do think that um, when you invite people to have a conversation and you start from the place that I believe every human being I come across, whether we're 100% agreed on everything or disagreed on everything, they're created in God's image. So I owe them at least a basic modicum of respect. And I think if you can start there and let people speak their piece, I want to hear from all sides. I trust our viewers. They can take that information and make their own judgments with it. But have a conversation where people feel they're respected. Uh, They get to make their points. Um, They're going to hear counterpoints. But we're going to have a conversation that I hope isn't just screaming and divisive, but actually moves issues forward. Okay, now your latest book, The Love Stories of the Bible Speak, Mm -hmm. Biblical Lessons on Romance, Friendship and Faith. Talk about that book. So much there, because it's not just the romantic relationships. The Bible does speak to those things. I did Song of Solomon. We had to include that in the book. That's a really tricky one. I turned to a lot of scholars to help me with that one. So there's the romantic love, but we also included in Love Stories the deep friendships, Jonathan and David, and many of the friendships that Jesus had all throughout the New Testament, again, often with women, which wasn't the norm of the day. He was somebody who um, redefined a lot of what was acceptable and what was holy and all of those things um, in society at that time. So we talk about the friendships, we talk about the romance, but to me the overarching story of the entire Bible is God's love for us, His pursuit of us, and man, I think there's story after story in the Bible that illustrates that again. He's pursuing us, He's forgiving, He's redeeming, um, and He then calls us to love others the way He loves us. He doesn't say, you know, when he's asked, you know, Christ in the New Testament to sum up the law, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and spirit, but also love your neighbor as yourself. Not just the people that you like and you go to the same clubs or churches or whatever. You're to love your neighbor, which is everyone in society, in the way that Christ did, which was completely sacrificial. So to me, we're called to a radical unselfishness, and that's the real love story of the Bible. 
Does the Bible tell that the Gator fans have to love the Seminole fans? <laughs> oh, yes, they have to love us, but I'm a Seminole. I don't know, but I'm pretty sure Jesus told me I have to love the Gators, too. All right, you mentioned friendship. Mm-hmm. With the COVID, so many of our young people, mm-hmm. and now, you know, their Bible, the cell phone, they don't seem to want or have friendships. Talk mm-hmm. about the importance of friendships. Yeah, that's really irreplaceable. And I do think there are people who still are hurting from COVID, whether it was losing a loved one or financial losses, job loss, education loss, that total isolation that some people found very, very difficult to walk through, the scariest moment in most people's lives. And to do it without that same network of people they were used to seeing every day, whether it was at school or work or on the bus or wherever it was, um, we really have long-term ramifications of that. And because so many young people live in the digital world, I'm always impressed when I meet a young person who can really shake your hand, look you in the eye, have a conversation. I, I will tell you, I was really heartened to find there was a new study out recently that said more and more young people are turning away from dating apps and saying they'd rather meet someone in person. And I thought, okay, that's a move in the right direction. I think maybe there is that hunger for getting back to personal one-on-one relationships, friend of a friend, meeting somebody in the grocery store or at church or wherever. Um, I'm hopeful that people are realizing the real benefit of the in-person friendships, um, and that digital can never replace that. You've interviewed an awful lot of people. Is there one living person you say, Jack, i got to get this person? Mm, living person. Oh, goodness. Um, God, I feel like I've been so privileged to interview so many people. You know who I've, I've tried many times to get a sit-down with and would love to do is Justice Clarence Thomas. Mm-hmm. Um, there are so many stories about his life. I found the, the story of his life, the book that he wrote, My Grandfather's Son, was really compelling. And regardless of where you are politically, I think if you remember that somebody could come from literally growing up in a home with dirt floors and become a Supreme Court justice, that should be inspiring to all of us, regardless of where you are ideologically. So I'm hopeful one day he'll sit down with us and, and give us more of that story. I'll call him and see what I can do, Shannon. Yeah, please do. I'm, I'm always after him, so I, I think I'm going to wear him down at some point. All right, Shannon Bream, it's been an honor to have you, and I want to commend you not just for what you do for all of America, but maybe more importantly, the grace, the charm with which you do it. Keep up the fabulous work. Jack, thank you, and thank you for all the goodness and inspiration you are putting into the world. I so appreciate it. Please join us next week. Until then, I'm Jack Crisula. Thanks for listening, and make it a great week, because with God, anything is possible. Spawn. Believe-